and did you come here? Jesus answered them and said, most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. Then they said to him, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. Amen. You may be seated. I'd like to preach for a subject just for a few minutes. God chasers. God chasers. Let us bow our hands for a word of prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for this day, even this day, this cold day, this day that you have created, that we can be glad in it, Father. Thank you for your love, your grace, and your peace. As we embark on this passage of scripture today, allow us to open up our spiritual understanding that we may understand God's word, put it in our hearts, that it can make a mark upon us that can never be erased. If there's somebody here who does not know Jesus Christ as their Savior, the Heavenly Father, we ask that the Holy Spirit will prick their hearts and they could say, what must I do to be saved? In Jesus' name, amen. 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 God chasers. As you all know, we as a church have been going through a series called The Ministry of Jesus Christ from the beginning of our church. And the way we explained it was we were going, really going through the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John on Sunday morning in chronological order. So to help you understand Jesus' ministry, we, we put it in that form in chronological order, understanding this, that his ministry only lasted three and a half years. So today, you wonder where are we in that series? Today is the start of the last year of Jesus' ministry as we begin to go in through scripture. So this is actually season three, which starts today. The last year and a half of Jesus' ministry. And there's a lot of things going on in this last uh, year and a half of Jesus' ministry as he embarks and gets ready to go to the cross. So that's where we are in his ministry now. So this is season three, episode one, taken from John 6, 22 through 29, God Chasers. So where are we in the story? Where are we in his ministry? Well, remember several messages ago, Jesus fed the 5,000. I know you can remember that. And we took that passage from Matthew. After Jesus fed the 5,000, they, he tried to get away with his disciples and he tried to have some quiet time with them. But that next morning, this massive crowd followed him again. So they're following Jesus. And the scripture says, even on that day, the next day, he healed all the sick. We, we read about that. And then uh, it got to the point where it became evening time. Jesus sent his disciples ahead of time uh, to go to the other side, to go to the city of Capernaum, and that he would meet them later. He went up to the mountain and prayed. And then we found out that while they were on their way in the boat to the other side, a storm came at night, and that Jesus began to walk on water. Mind you, while Jesus was doing this, the people that were that he fed are still waiting on the other side, thinking that Jesus is still there. Jesus walks on the water, gets to the other side, and the scripture picks up from right there. It picks us right there where they get to the next day and they figure out that Jesus is not there. So the scripture says that they themselves go into a boat and they cross the other side and we pick up the conversation that they had there. So this point, I have only three points and I'm going to my seat after this to tell you this. Here's point number one, God chasers. What are people chasing after? People are chasing after all types of gods. And we know that there is only one God. There's only one true God, and we know who that God is. We know he expresses himself in three persons, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But at this point, these people are chasing Jesus, and they want him to be king. They want him to be king for one reason and one reason only, and we're going to find that out. So my point 
And point number one, which is verse 22 through 26, is this. People are looking or chasing after God, and they're looking for love in all the wrong places. They're chasing after God in the wrong places. And that brings me to the point of verse 22 through 26, where it says that these people actually got in boats, and they went to the other side looking for Jesus. And I want you to understand that they weren't looking for entertainment. That's not what they were looking for. They were looking for Jesus to feed them. They were looking for Jesus to do what he did when he fed the 5,000. You remember he fed the 5,000 with uh, two fish and, and a few loaves of bread. So they were not looking for entertainment. They were looking for somebody to feed them. As a matter of fact, we know that they weren't looking for entertainment was because they didn't even notice that Jesus just did a miracle with the 5,000. They didn't even notice that he took two fish and fed over 20,000 people because they were so caught up in themselves, they didn't realize how good God had been to them. And this shows you something this, and this is this. In, in, in our Christianity, we must understand there's two kinds of disciples. You have disciples who are true disciples, but don't you know that there are disciples who are false disciples? There are people who are following Jesus Christ, but following him under wrong motives, under false pretenses. And we call them false disciples. Disciples, Yes, they are disciples, but false disciples. They are like Judas. Judas was a disciple. Judas actually healed the sick. Judas actually did the miracles as the other disciples. But Judas was a false disciple. Why? Because his heart wasn't right. His, his, his heart wasn't right. His motives were not right. And I'm here to tell you that there are people today who say that they love the Lord, but their heart is not right. Their mind is not right when it comes down to really worshiping Jesus Christ. And today we're going to figure out how to figure that out. How do you know who is a true disciple or a false disciple? And the first example is this. We know the difference between true and false based on what people are chasing. What are you chasing? What are you chasing after? Are you chasing after God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or are you chasing the God of materialism? Right. Are you chasing the God of the, the prosperity gospel, the God of health and wealth? Let me give you an example. There are people who come to churches, and it doesn't matter what church it is. There are people out there that go to churches, they're looking for handouts, right? They're looking for food, and they're, they're looking for money. But did you notice that most people that come to churches always with their hand out asking for things, they don't want to stay to listen to the word. No, no, they just want you to help them out. And, and fill their need of whatever the physical need is, but they ain't got time to sit long enough to hear what thus saith the Lord. That's an example of somebody who can be caught up into being a false disciple rather than a good disciple. Yeah, they, they, they will come looking for food, gas, money, but they won't sit there to hear God's word. What they really want, I want my physical needs met. I don't care about my spiritual needs. I want my physical needs met. The good news is that, yes, they are diligent enough to chase after Jesus. Yes, they were diligent enough to get in the boat and come on to the other side and chase after him. But did you know, really, people don't know what they need. If you don't have God in your life and God guiding you, then you don't know that you need a spiritual transformation in your life. It reminds me of a movie. I don't know if you saw this movie called Forrest Gump. Well, in Forrest Gump, the movie is an old movie for you young people. There was a character named by, by the name of Lieutenant Dan. And Lieutenant Dan was sitting next to Forrest Gump and uh, they were watching a movie. And in the movie, the choir began to sing. He was watching the scene where the choir was singing. Lieutenant Dan looks over to Forrest Gump and says, he says, Gump, have you found Jesus? And Gump said, looked over to him and says, I didn't know I was looking for him in the first place. 
So in other words, is that the case with us? Are we looking for Jesus or are we just standing there saying, I'm just going to church just to fill a, a physical need? You're going to always have people that are going to come to church looking for God, but looking in all the wrong places and for all the wrong reasons. People come to church because they want simple needs met. What are those needs? Food, clothing, shelter, career, family, toys, and health. But something we need to start telling these people when they come to the church, listen, yes, we will try to help you with your physical need, but you also have a spiritual need as well. It seems to me that we put too much emphasis on the physical need, but we're not telling people that they need a spiritual need as well. Did you tell people that, did you know that your, your spiritual need outweighs your physical need? Did you know that your spiritual need is going to outlast your physical need? Did you know that the spiritual you is going to outlast the physical you? So it seems to me that you will put more emphasis on the spiritual you rather than the physical you. It's amazing how people, when you watch the news and the celebrities, how everybody's trying to get this touch up and everybody trying to get this in plan and everybody dying their, dying their hair and they're doing this and doing that for the physical body and I don't care how old you get and how much you pull on that skin, you still won't get 80 years old one day. And you're not going to look that good, you know, with your skin pulled that far back. People have done it already, right? You've seen people older who have the money to try to pull their skin back and tuck this and tuck that and cut this and cut that. And, you know, you can tell still that they got one foot in the grave and one on this other side. So I don't care what you do to the body. You can do whatever you want to. You can fix it up. You can cut it. You can do whatever you want to. But one of these days, you're going to leave here. And your spiritual side needs to be more important than your physical side. Would you want to stand before God and look at God and God tell you, yeah, uh, yeah, I spent all that time going to the gym. I got myself together looking good on the outside. But he says, guess what? The inside is rotten. That, that's the problem. Yeah, you look good on the outside, but what about the inside? What about your mind? What about your spirit? You spend all that money on your physical self, but you never spent any time on your spiritual self. So the bad news is, yes, they chased after God, but the bad news is they didn't understand who he was. They saw, they saw Jesus right there, God in the flesh. Here's the one who can provide all of their physical and spiritual needs, but yet they wouldn't sit long enough to listen to the words of Jesus. People's motives for chasing God are not always right. You know, people, you ask them, why do you go to church? You're going to get a hundred different answers on why people go to church. Some people go to church to find a boyfriend or girlfriend. Some people go to church because they like the way the choir sounds. Some people go to church because they've been going to church out of tradition. But the scripture says the reason you should be going to church is to get a spiritual need met. That's why we come here to serve God. Notice what these people said in verse 22 through 26. We don't have to read it. I'll quote it for you. They said, when did you come to the other side? Really, what they were asking Jesus, how did you get over here? Now, we knew we got into a boat, but Jesus, how did you get over here to the other side? Now, Jesus could have told them, like most preachers would today, uh, I walked on the water. You know, preachers, they love to talk about how good they are. You know, I don't know if y'all saw this new show called Preachers of uh, Detroit. That's on it. And to me, people are really talking about how good they are. They're putting, they putting themselves on the pedestal rather than Jesus on the pedestal. And I, I, could, I could see it because I saw it the other night how they talked about themselves more than they talked about Jesus. They really need to have a show called The Real Preachers of Detroit. And then you go around the city and find preachers that's feeding the hungry and preachers who don't worry about their house. Preachers who don't worry about their cars, and preachers who don't have Rolex watches and rings on every finger, and preachers who are not worried about th this and that, and the only thing they're concerned about is trying to save a soul in the city, then that's when they can really have a show about what real ministry is all about. So yeah, Jesus could have said, I walked on the water, but he didn't. 
He didn't tell them how he got to the other side. All Jesus did is say, listen, all you want is your physical needs met. So guess what? Guess what? We as born again believers can't look for love in all the wrong places. We need to look for Jesus for everything that he has given us. Point number two, and this is found in verse 27. People are chasing food with all the wrong choices. Look at verse 27. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. Don't chase after the things of this world by working for it. In other words, you got people out there working their way to hell instead of accepting the grace of God to he's going to let you in without one work, without one idea, without anything that you have done. He can accept you right now if you just repent and accept him. There's not one work that you can do. There's not one deed that you can do to get yourself into heaven. You can't help people across the street to get you into heaven. You can't give your way into heaven. You can't, I'm going to stop cussing and I'm going to make it to heaven. No, that's not how you get to heaven. You cannot get to heaven by stop sinning because you're not going to stop sinning. That's not, the, that's not the answer. God didn't save you to say you're not going to sin anymore because we're going to make mistakes, right? We're going to make mistakes along the way. He's saying, I'm saving your spirit, so now when you have that urge to sin, you really have somebody to call on. You really have somebody in the Word of God to study, to help you along the way. And I don't know where we got to the teaching where Christians feel that they are holier than thou, and that they've been in church for 20 years, and you don't you arrive. Nobody has arrived. You haven't arrived until you lay right out here in front of this, then you arrive. When you stretched out here, when you leave this body, you have arrived because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So when you get there, then you arrive. But until you are in the present with him, you are going to struggle with sin. You're going to struggle with this body. You're going to struggle with your mind. And just think this. Don't think that you're not born again because you struggle with the flesh, because you struggle with the mind. That's what the fight is all about. That's what the battle is all about. There is never going to be a time in your life that the devil ain't going to try you in every area of your life, financially, physically, mentally, through your family, through folks on your job, everywhere you turn around, you're going to run into fights and struggles, spiritual fights, spiritual struggles that you need to say, wait a minute, it's nothing more than the devil trying to get me to walk away from God's word. Let me tell you what he said to the woman at the well. He said this in John 4. John 4 verse 13 and 14, write this down. Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst, but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. So this is what he's saying. While we're chasing after physical food, while we're chasing after temporary things, he says, how come we're not eating spiritual food? Because it's the spiritual food that's going to last forever. It's the spiritual food that's going to push you and cause you to keep walking by faith and not by sight. It's the spiritual food that you need to be chasing after, not chasing after temporary things. How many know everything in this world won't pass away? How many know the food that you eat, the cars that everybody lusting after, all the clothes and the jewelry? The, you know, I, I don't mind people, these people get mad at other people for wearing knockoff clothes. I wear knockoffs, y'all. Oh, it's all going to burn up anyway. You think I got a Rolex? It's a Grolex. That's right. That's what it is. That's right. I go to the gas station to buy a watch. It don't matter to me. You may think that I'm wearing $10,000 clothes. But you don't know, I just went around the corner and spent this much for it. See, people so caught up into how much stuff costs instead of looking at, wait a minute, God just made a way out of no way. 
It is just a matter of, here's the point, how people just want a quick fix. People want to come to church for a quick fix. Heard of a story of a woman who got her car was stalled in the street. And then uh, she, she flagged down for some help, and some guy pulled over and came over to her car, and she told him, my car just went out. She said, but my husband said, all you have to do when you open up the hood is just jiggle the wire, and the car will start up again. So he pulls up the hood, and he looked at the, the battery and the cables connected to the battery, and the cable was totally off. The battery. So he went to the woman and said, listen, uh, it, your situation is a little more different than that. The, the cable is off the battery. She said, oh, no, no, no. My husband said, all you got to do is just jiggle the wire. He said, ma'am, if I just put this wire back around your cable, then every time you turn your car off, somebody going to have to lift up your hood and you have to jiggle the wire again. He says, if you have some tools in your car, then give me a couple of tools. I'll fix your your situation that uh, you don't have to jiggle the wire what can happen is I can fix it and you will be on your way so you know that's just like people today people want God just to jiggle the wires of their life right God just just give me a quick fix right now God said I can fix it permanently but you don't want God to fix it permanently you don't know no, God I don't want you to fix my family permanently just jiggle my family just a little bit so I can get along the way and get along with them no God I don't want you to fix my finances permanently so I can give 10% or 11% or 12%. I just want just enough so I can get by. No, God, I don't want you to fix my health situation. I just want you to jiggle the wires of my life a little bit so I can feel just a little bit better to go on in each and every day. God don't just want to jiggle your wires. He want to fix the situation. He want to make a permanent fix, and the only way he can make a permanent fix in your life is, guess what? You got to submit to him. You got to turn everything over to him, and when you do that, guess what happens? He will make a permanent situation in your life. Listen to this. We need to seek permanent, eternal food. And that's why the Bible tells us this. It says that we need to study ourselves, to study to show ourselves approved of God, workmen that need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. How much time do we spend with God? How much time do we spend in his word? How much time do we spend in prayer each and every day? Are we chasing after something else or are we chasing after God? Rather than chasing false gods, I think it was Sister Blair, she, that was a great quote that she quoted. I love that saying by Martin Luther King uh, Jr. about the gods. He said, we're chasing these gods of the world. And that's exactly, he says, I don't want to chase the gods of this world. I want the God who will give us eternal life. There is food. There is spiritual food that you can eat of every single day that will sustain you. So do we tell unsaved people about this spiritual food? Or do we just let them walk each and every day thinking that this life is the only life that's going to sustain them? Uh, yeah, Jesus says, don't. Let that food perish. Let that food get away. Watch this. The last point I want to bring to you is this. Verse 28, 29. People seek after God or chase after false gods, striving to work for all the wrong graces. They want to work for the wrong graces. How so? Look at verse uh, 28. But before you get to verse 28, yeah, 28. Then they said to him, what shall we do? that we may work the works of God. Then verse 29, Jesus answered and said unto them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. Listen to this, God, people need to need the Lord, but they only think they need the Lord to give them what they want. People try to use God like a vending machine. They put something in and out comes their blessing. No, God is not a vending machine. God is not a genie. And that you rub on the Bible, oh, Jesus, give me a house. No, that's not how the Bible works. It is not a good luck coin. You can't, you know what I'm going to do? And tonight I'm going to just put my Bible under my pillow. And I'm going to sleep on the Bible. Maybe the blessings come that way. 
Or no, I'm gonna put two candles on the side. I'll make a little altar in my house, put two candles, light the candles every night before I go to bed. We are so superstitious about the Bible and about what the Bible provides. He didn't say the book itself is uh, precious. It's what's in the book that's precious. We say, oh, no, don't touch this, don't touch that. Don't, you don't need your Bible here. It's a book. Pick up the words out of the book and you read that. Be more, be more sacred. Call, let the words that's in the book be more sacred than the Bible itself. Some of you brought some brand new Bibles. I ain't opened it yet because you told me it's the family Bible. It, it, goes, on the, it goes on the shelf. Right? That family Bible ain't doing you no good on the shelf. Take it off the shelf, open it up, and read the contents in it because that's what's going to get you through. So yes, watch this, watch this. He said, listen, he said, listen, listen, there's two ways you can get to Jesus. Here it is. One, repentance. How do you get to Jesus? Through repentance. Luke 13, 3 says this. I tell you, Jesus is talking. No, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. In order to get to Jesus, you got to have a repentive heart. And we talked about that in Sunday school this morning. The difference between a true disciple and a false disciple is a person who has a changed heart. It didn't say you had to be perfect. It says you had to have a changed heart. That means this. You're working on yourself. God is working with you. God is working through you. God is helping you each and every day of your life. That's what it means. But see, it's people who say that they got it all together. They don't, you know, I don't need no help. I don't need this. I have arrived. And they're looking down on other folks. That's when you know something is wrong. If you are struggling with something, you just need to go to God to pray every single time. God, I need your help. God, I need you each and every day of my life. Then God will make a way somehow. Notice, notice what these people said. The question was in verse 28, what can we do to do the works that you do? Stop right there. They wanted this. Jesus, since you won't do it, since you won't create two fish and five loaves of bread every day so we can eat, show us how to do it. Show us how we can do the same work that you did. Jesus said, listen, no, no, no. You can't do what I do. You can't do the works and miracles that I did. He says, but there's something you can do. Now, I want you to really, really look at that last verse. This is what work you are supposed to do. This is the only work you need to do to get to heaven. Look at verse 29. He says this, Jesus answered and said it to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. So the only way, the only work that God accepts for you to get into heaven is what? Belief in him who was sent. Who was the one that was sent? Jesus Christ. So, when you say you have faith, now we got to define what belief means. He didn't just say believe that he was born, believe that he was born of a virgin, believe that he died on the cross. He's not referring to that. When he says belief, belief causes action, right? If I really believe in something, I'm going to act on what I believe in. If I really believe in something, if you told me that I won a million dollars, I'm really going to believe it, so you're going to now tell me where to go pick up my million, right? And then I'm going to get in my car and find out where you told me to go pick up the million. So guess what? If I didn't believe that you told me I won a million, I'd just sit in my house and say, he's just lying. I ain't going nowhere. But if you said you believe in Christ, then act like you believe in Christ. If you say you believe that he saved you, then act like he saved you, because that's what the world is looking at. You said you was a Christian. Now, if you were a Christian, I thought Christians do this. Or I thought Christians say that. Then some of your excuses may be, I I'm just a baby Christian. You know, I just got saved yesterday. Okay, that's good. But you got saved 20 years ago. <laughs> 20 years ago. So how, what's your excuse now? Why are you still doing? Now, you can say, I, I really believe in God. I really have faith. So now you have to admit that you haven't studied enough. You haven't dedicated your life enough to grow in your grace. 
to grow in your faith. That's where it is. You still at baby level faith. That's why you still smoking in this 20 years later. Yeah, see, you still at baby level faith because that's why you still doing what you're doing when you should have turned away from half that stuff a long time ago. But guess what? God worked with you where you at. That's right. He worked with you where you at. It's 20 years later now. You're still smoking. Now you got cancer. And so eventually, you're going to make it to heaven one way or the other. The smoking is not going to send you to hell. It's going to cut some days off down here. The drinking is not going to send you to hell. Guess what? It's just going to cut some of the days off because now you got cirrhosis of the liver because you couldn't put down the bottle, right? And you may have a sincere faith to serve God, but every time we don't line up with God about this body, because your body is supposed to be the temple of the Holy Ghost, you don't cut your salvation off. You cut your time off here. And now you got a shorter time to tell somebody about Jesus Christ. That's why I said, yeah, yeah, you're supposed to take care of this body. You're supposed to be able to do what I want you to do. Why? So you can tell a dying world that Jesus Christ is real. So yes, Jesus, Jesus tells them this, in order to get to heaven, believe. And I'm telling you, and after you believe, then you act on what you believe. And when you act on what you believe, then Jesus will make everything all right. I'm going to my seat as I tell you this story. Listen to this. There's a story of a man who was a photographer. And he was a photographer for people who jumped out of airplanes. He himself jumped out of airplanes and he would jump with the group and they would jump and so his picture he had the camera connected to his helmet so he'd take millions of pictures of people as they free fall and he will also have fun free falling so this particular day he jumps out of the airplane the group already jumped out he jumps out of the airplane and he's taking all of these pictures and everything now you know when you're free falling it looks like you're going real slow but there's a point in time that you got to pull the cord right so you can go back up. Well, he's taking all these pictures while he's falling, and he reaches for the ripcord and find out he don't even have a parachute on at all. So he jumped out of the plane in excitement of being a photographer that he forgot to put the parachute on himself. So guess what? He plummeted to his death. He had a free fall of understanding that, wait a minute, this is good right now, but wait a minute, I don't, I don't even have my parachute on. There are a lot of people in your life that are in a free fall. They have a fun while they're falling, right? Until they realize, wait a minute, I'm in danger. Wait a minute, I don't have my parachute on. Wait a minute, I can't pull on the Ripcord. Wait a minute, I need help in my life. And I'm here to tell you that if you chase after the real God, then he'll, you'll get your parachute. Yeah, when you chase after the real God, you'll have your life insurance plan already set. When you chase after the real God, then you'll have everything order in order for Jesus. So yes, become a God chaser. But don't chase after the God of money. Become a God chaser. And don't chase after after the God of material things. Become a God chaser, but don't chase after promotion. God will promote you in due season. Yeah, yeah, become a God chaser, but don't chase after the God of physical health, because God is the one who wakes you up every morning and puts you in your right mind. You haven't heard of stories of people who thought they were in perfect health, and the next day they end up in the hospital? It's because God is keeping you. It's because God is helping you. Don't you know that in most African American communities that poverty is so bad that, that these families in African American communities have to eat fast food every, every other day, meaning that they're not eating the best food that they can eat, but guess what? God's still keeping them in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. While you think you're eating your rich food, the guy who's eating McDonald's every day outliving you. You see what I'm saying? Because God is the one who keeps us. So don't be a God chaser for material things, but be a God chaser after the one who can save your soul. Be a God chaser after the one who can turn you around and place your feet on solid ground. Be the God chaser of the one who came down 42 generations, who was born of a virgin named Mary. Be the one who chases after the one who God put his spirit inside of Jesus Christ, and Jesus healed the sick. Yeah, he raised the dead, but Jesus said, I came to die. I came to die for you. I came to die because you were born in sin and you were shaped into iniquity. I came to save you from a life.
life of thinking about that this world is all that you have. How many of you know that we got a better world than this world? How many of you know that we got a home that we're going to? We got a better home. This place is not my home. This place is full of sin. This place is full of shame. But I thank God that there is a better place. So I'm chasing. I'm chasing after God. I'm chasing after Jesus. I'm chasing after his love. I'm chasing after his hope. I'm chasing after his peace. Are you going to be a God chaser? Are you going to chase after Jesus? Are you going to chase after what he's done for you? He's been good. So keep chasing after him. He's brought you from a mighty long way. Keep chasing after him. He filled you with his precious Holy Ghost. Keep chasing after him. And one of these days, it won't be long. He's coming back again for a church without a spot or Somebody say yes. Somebody say yes. We serve a good God. So chase after him. Come on. Put your hands together. He's good. Chase after him. And not the face of this world. Let's bow our heads.